And I think what I've got in the room here is a whole bunch of his relatives and descendants come out of them. otherwise. I might just ask for a show of hands. How many of you are somehow kin to this old fellow? Oh, well, quite a few, several. I thought so. Uh, how did I get interested in him? Well, uh, because I grew up hearing this story. Uh, first, let me explain why I was hearing this story. Uh, when I was a, a small child, of course, I heard about the connection. My father's mother, my, mat, my paternal grandmother, she had two parents, most of us do. One of them was Eliza Drawball Grissinger. Eliza fell in love with Jeremiah Grissinger back around 1863 or 4, and uh, uh, there was a another event going on, the American Civil War. And everybody uh, thought they should go serve somehow, and then Mr. Lincoln decided there would be a draft. <coughs> but not everybody thought that was a good idea. And uh, so, neither did my great-grandfather, Jacob Grissinger. And Jacob did something that today would be politically impossible to do. He came up with the $300 to buy out my great-grandfather, Jeremiah, out of the Civil War. Now, $300 in 1863 was a bunch of money. It was a whole year's wages for a working guy, even more than a year's wages uh, for some. You could get a, a, a cow hand for $11 a month. Uh, so $300 was not trivial, but Good for great-great-grandpa Jacob Grissinger because he had the money and Jeremiah didn't have to go to war and see, so he survived that experience that he did have and married my great-grandmother and that's how we got my grandmother. Anyway, but my great-grandmother was one of Daniel Drawbaugh's sisters and apparently there were several siblings and so there are descendants, collateral descendants all over the place. I keep running into them. None of them send money. <laughs> so, uh, that's now, so the story I heard, of course, from my father, mostly, is that Uncle Dan was done in. It was a cruel and corrupt world out there, and evil people in New York and Washington and other places conspired to deprive Daniel of his rightful claim to be the true inventor of the telephone. <coughs> Wasn't this terrible? He was also told to me that Alexander Graham Bell, that scoundrel, had come here, had befriended Daniel, and had stolen the secret and went back to Boston to invent the telephone, which Daniel had already invented. That's the story I heard. Is any of that so? Well, we're not sure. So, um, a real quick bio. Uh, Daniel was born in 1827. Uh, he was descended from a family that in Germany, I think it came out as Trorbaugh, T-R-O-R-B-A-U-G-H. Somehow the consonant shift went backward and went from a T to a D. I guess that's so. I, we have some genealogies in our family because my wife, when we were first married, she decided to make me a proper uh, a husband, had to have a lot of ancestors, and she found a lot of my family tree and genealogy for me some of which may be true, I hope it is. Anyway, so it was Trogball, and they were poor, and he went to school, as Daniel put it, uh, for three or four years of common school, which he said in those days was very common indeed. Uh, so he had no formal education other than simple country school, which most people in those days did, of course. That's one of the issues that come up later. Okay, and he never, as people say, never had a real job. He tinkered, he had a shop, he invented things, he got patents, he had lots of children. He was a terrible businessman, and he lived until 1911. But, how many of you, how many of you, and of course the question is, can you find it? Maybe you want it. <laughs> but, How many of you will be able to say that you had your obituary in the New York Times? Daniel did. 
Here's the New York Times for November 4th, 1911. Daniel, headline, Daniel F. Drawbaugh dead. Subheadline, inventor of one of the earliest telephones was 84 years old. The Times was hedging on the issue. Harrisburg, Pennsylvania, November 3rd. Daniel F. Drawbaugh, an inventor of telephonic and other appliances. Telephonic, a word we do not use. Died at his home near this city today. Mr. Drawba was 84 years old. He was the inventor of one of the earliest telephones and was involved in extended litigation over patent rights with other inventors. He also invented pneumatic tools, hydraulic rams, folding lunch boxes, barrel faucets. What is a barrel faucet? Measuring machines to be used in wrapping goods and coin separators. Mr. Drawbaugh experimented for years with wireless telephones and a few years ago is said to have succeeded in carrying on a conversation at a distance of four miles. For the last month he had been at work on a wireless burglar alarm and was seized with an attack of apoplexy while in his laboratory. Oh my. So there we are. That's, at least he made the times. Well, you make the times. Well, now, so what, what's it all about? Uh, what, uh, the whole business of sending information over a wire had already started. It started about in the early 1840s with the invention of the telegraph and the idea that you could send information over a wire. It starts with a guy in America uh, with four names and one of the few people who wind up being studied in two different departments of universities. If you take a, a, a course in American art, you're gonna run into Samuel Finley Brees Morse, who became a major portrait painter and a serious painter. Uh, even though in his early years, he failed terribly at doing it, he's still highly regarded. And then he turns up on a history of technology in some science course. Uh, he's the guy who came up with the telegraph. Uh, so, that's a pretty extraordinary story all by itself. Uh, so, of course, the telephone caught on very, the telegraph caught on very quickly. And by the, <coughs> so, and uh, Morse was able to persuade the government to engage in some government support, federal support for scientific pro uh, progress and uh, by financing the laying of the telegraph line from Washington to Baltimore. So when the Whig Convention in 1844 selected Henry Clay as its candidate and the Democrats selected a guy named John C. Polk, the news got to Washington, not as, as it always had before, as fast as the horse could get there, but as fast as the telegraph operator could click away. So that was an extraordinary event in the history of the world and the history of the communication. So in a few years, telegraph lines were everywhere and polls were everywhere and Abraham Lincoln could learn on election night that he had been elected. Nobody had ever done that before. So, so what was going on is uh, <coughs> the idea of sending speech over a wire was floated. Nobody imagined that we would do anything other than send somehow send kind of some kind of speech signals over a telegraph wire. In fact, they talked about developing what they called the harmonic telegraph. They were ex expression we do not use anymore. Nobody imagined that in another century and a half, you could pull this thing here out of your <laughs> pocket, push a couple of uh, click a couple of times, and all of a sudden. You've got Cousin Clarabelle and Medicine Hamp, Maine, on the phone, and she, you're talking to her. That was not imagined. What was imagined was that telegraph operators could actually talk to each other. It wasn't really at the top of the technological, technological uh, wish list. Right up the top was a more immediate problem, how do you send more than one message at a time? Because when you have to do Morse code, click, click, <coughs> dot, dot, dash, 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 it takes a while to get your stuff across. The fastest telegraph operators could do a few words a minute.
But everybody wanted to send a telegram all of a sudden. You wanted to talk to, to send a telegram to your cousin Clarabelle in Medicine Hat. And, and so everybody wanted to do that. And so there was this avalanche of need for faster telegraph operating. And actually, a young guy named Thomas Edison actually got a contract to invent a way to send multiple messages over a telegraph wire. But the idea of sending speech over the wire was fooling. We were fooling around with it. A lot of people were. A guy in Germany, Johann Philipp Reis, R-E-I-S, in the early 1860s came up with a gadget in which he could send some sound over a wire. He couldn't get the quality of speech, but he got some tones over the wire. Uh, it sort of almost worked, not quite. But the Germans take that seriously, and apparently in the 1960s, the Germans had a centennial celebration for the invention of the telephone, which they gave credit for to this guy, Rise. So, um, other people are, were working on the problem. For example, I'll give you some of the names. An Italian fellow, Antonio Mucci, M-E-U-C-C-I, he came up with some kind of a device in the 1860s, and in Italy they celebrate him as the inventor of the telephone. <laughs> uh, there's also in its, you know, Cinzo Manzetti, he is another Italian guy, and he came up with something. There's a guy named Charles Borsu, B-O-U-R-S-E-U-L, a French fellow. In 1854, he thought he had invented the telephone. Amos Dolbear, don't forget Amos, he came up with a way to measure the temperature with the number of clicks a cricket made per minute. He, uh, he also came up with something. Like, don't, and do not forget Sylvanus Cushman, Edward Ferrar, and James McDonough. Now, so a lot of people are fooling around with the problem, can we somehow send human speech over a wire? And then there was Don Amici. Now you're all too young to remember the movie. But Don Amici played Alexander Graham Bell in the movie in the 1930s. And he was fooling around with the problem. Now, Alexander Graham Bell, of course, had a history. Uh, there were deaf people in his family. He was a student of speech and of sound, and his father, a guy named Melville Bell, uh, was fooling around with a system he called visible speech. And it was Alexander Graham Bell's father, who was well known in the British Isles for doing this, was the model for what, uh, in George Bernard Shaw's vision, was a satire on him in the persons of Henry Higgins who, of course, teaches Eliza in My Fair Lady how to speak properly. It all fits together. Yes, Henry Higgins <coughs> is a spoof on Alexander Graham Bell's father. <coughs> so, everybody is fooling around with this problem. Now, what is a telephone, by the way? What does a telephone do? Now, here we have a problem. You are looking at a man who had to take one year of Princeton physics whether he wanted to or not, when he was 17 years old, and I must confess, it was a struggle. But uh, we somehow made it through. Uh, well, so what does the telephone do? Well, there are sound waves, and there are wiggles in the air. They wiggle. And when they wiggle, they hit something else that's maybe carbon granules, maybe water, uh, maybe pig skin. It's something that vibrates. If, and causes electrical current to undulate. That's the word they used. They didn't use modulate. They used, they talked about undulating the current from a, a Greek or Latin word for wave, making waves. Uh, and that current goes somewhere else and then it hits another medium which creates the sound waves which imitate or replicate the sound waves you started out with. So when you hear Cousin Clarabelle on the phone, you're not really hearing Cousin Clarabelle, of course, you're hearing sound waves produced by electrical uh, frequency modulations or variations which re reproduce what the sound waves did at the other end. So a telephone is a way of translating this wave motion from sound to electricity and back to sound. So everybody's fooling around with that problem, including a fella in 
Cumberland County, Pennsylvania, with uh, three or four years of education named Daniel Drobaugh. Now, what did Daniel Drobaugh understand about all this? He had never had one year of physics. He hadn't had physics at all. He probably didn't know the word. Uh, the problem is not a lot of people didn't know that either. Bell knew a little bit about it, but the, what we have to realize is that in the 1850s and 1860s and 1870s, we were just beginning to understand what electricity was. Maxwell's equations were just being formulated in the 1860s and 1870s. Mr. Hertz in Germany was just beginning to write his papers. The Michelson-Morley experiment, which demonstrated that the speed of light is a constant and there's no such thing as the luminiferous ether, didn't happen until 1887. So physics was in its infancy. So uh, Daniel Drobal apparently tried to keep up, though. He subscribed to Scientific American, a magazine started in 1846, which reported all the latest stuff that was going on in science. Uh, how much did he understand about what he read? Did he read about this? We don't really know that. Unfortunately, the man kept no diaries and kept no notes of his experiments, and so we really, and, he, and we don't seem to have any letters. There aren't a lot of stories. Uh, actually, there's only one book about Daniel Drawball, a whole book about him, and I found it on Amazon some years ago, and it was published in, eight, in 1960, and written by a guy who worked for the uh, local newspapers named Warren J. Harder, published by the University of Pennsylvania Press. I have, I went on Amazon a few years ago and found this. There were two copies in the world, I bought one. I paid too much, but that's what Amazon does. <laughs> How many of you know about this book? A couple of people do, yeah, yeah, okay. So, now, so in the midst of all this that's going on, Daniel Drawball is a busy man. He is inventing things, uh, and uh, he gets a lot of patents and most of them don't seem to be very important in the world. Do we really need a, uh, uh, a, a, a stave machine? I don't know what a stave is, actually. But, uh, yeah. So, but he gets a device going that we call the telephone. Now, 1876 comes, and in 1876 there's a big ex ex centennial exposition in Philadelphia, and everybody wants to go there because that's the late, you'll see what all the latest stuff is happening. Alexander Graham Bell gets there, and he gets his telephone, which doesn't quite work yet, but he gets the emperor of Brazil, a guy named Dom Pedro, to show up, and. He hears it talk, and the emperor said to him, said, my God, it talks. And so uh, he gets some notice. Daniel Drawball goes there, apparently. By 1876, you could take the train to Philadelphia. The train went by Daniel's house, you know. In the, the, the line from Lemoyne to Carlisle actually goes very close to where he actually lived in uh, Lower Long Township. Uh, for some reason, Daniel, although he's got his phone to work, he doesn't take it along. Why doesn't he? We don't know that. So, and he doesn't apply for a patent. Why doesn't he apply for a patent? Because he had applied for other patents. He said later in the lawsuit, well, I didn't have the money. It cost $10. Well, $10 was a lot of money in 1876 but maybe he could have come up with it. He did borrow $5 to go to his father's funeral. He didn't have any money. He never had any money. Okay, so now, right away, uh, Bell gets a patent, and there's a whole other story about that that is better known to historians than the Drobo story, the Elijah Gray story. 
Elijah Gray was another fellow inventing a telephone. And the story is, and there's a whole book about this uh, that is called uh, the, uh, the Telephone Conspiracy of 1876 by a guy by a. a. Edward Evanson, uh, in which it is said that he, uh, Bell somehow managed to bribe the patent examiner to get a look at Elisha Gray's patent application, or caveat they called it, went back and he changed his application accordingly and got his application filed first. Okay. Well, that may be, uh, but that's a whole other part of the story. Okay. Now, right away, we get into something I now call venture capital. We call that now venture capital. Some people get together and they get a hold of somebody who's invented something or has an idea and they put money into it. And ex in exchange for financing the deal, they get a big piece of the action. I don't think we used the word venture capital in 1876, but we use it now. Two groups of people suddenly took place. The Bell people got together and formed a company and they started to put out telephones. So by, in a few years, there were thousands of telephones in use around the United States and telephone lines were appearing everywhere. Drawball came to the attention of some other venture capital people and they got together with Daniel and they actually gave him some money. Now I have two versions of the story because I have two different numbers. The one is that he got $5,000 and a piece of the company that was being formed. And another version of the story is that he got $20,000 and a piece of the company. We don't seem to know how many shares he got, but he got some share of the company, but he, uh, we don't know that for sure. And I, now, whether it was 5,000 or 20,000, it didn't much matter because he always owed everybody and uh, that money, I'm sure, disappeared right away because when the man died, he had $350. That was all that was left when they paid the bills. Well, now, Right away, we have a lawsuit. And what you have is the Bell people going into court. They go into the United States District Court for the Southern District of New York, which is Manhattan, and they bring a suit in equity to enjoin the drawball company. It's not called the drawable company at that point. It's called something else. They, to enjoin them from stopping them from selling their telephones and installing them. And so uh, this is not a minor lawsuit. This is a major thing because the drawable defense is your patent's no good. Our patents are better because our invention preceded yours. We were talking on the telephone before you got yours to work. Therefore, your patent is invalid. Now, apparently under the patent law of the time, it wasn't first to file that mattered so much, it was first to make it work that mattered. And if they could prove to the satisfaction of the court that the drawball phone worked before the Bell phone worked, the Bell patent collapses and the Bell system collapses and the drawball people win. So this is a big problem. And this is not a small lawsuit. Uh, no, this is not an afternoon in court and then go home and the judge decides. There were 1,047 pages of exhibits. There were 2,476 pages of depositions. There were 169 separate depositions taken in Harrisburg, in Baltimore, in Philadelphia, and in New, and in New York. Uh, the, the total record was 6,446 pages. And, and there were dozens and dozens of witnesses who testified 
Basically, yes, we went to Daniel's shop in Everly's Mills and we talked on his telephone. We heard it talk. We heard it work. Yes, we knew it worked. And uh, so all, after all this was done, can you imagine what the lawyer's bills were? Good heavens. Well, of course, Daniel wasn't paying the lawyer's bills. Once more, these were venture capitalists and they were trying to take the drawball thing and beat the bell people. If they had won, it would have been a different story, but they didn't. Because after much uh, agony, the, the, the judge came down with a long opinion, which was published in full in this order book, in which he said basically, uh, I don't believe it. Uh, the bell, bell thing worked before the draw ball thing. I, the, basically, the idea that these, uh, draw, these telephones in draw ball shop actually worked before bells did, uh, we don't believe. Therefore, we are holding for bell, and we're holding the bell panels, panels valid, and uh, you draw ball people are out of luck. Go home. Uh, it wasn't over yet. They appealed to the United States Supreme Court. It wasn't until 1884, I think, that the court came down with a decision. Two of the judges recused themselves for various reasons, but the final decision was four to three in favor of the Bell patents. So by one vote, by one vote in the Supreme Court, uh, the whole Bell system would have collapsed and it would have been a whole different story and maybe we'd all be richer than we are. Because you know, those of us who are relatives, we should all be vice presidents of this company, the drone boat telephone company. Well, it didn't work out that way. That way. Now, uh, what was the basis of the court's findings? Basically, the Supreme Court bought the district judges court judge's idea that, well, Jomo was just a country bumpkin, he couldn't have done it, and there was, these witnesses didn't know what they were talking about, we'll disregard them. Bell, the Bell knew what he was doing. And so, uh, so I think that judge was a victim of what uh, I have, I think I may have coined a phrase. I have not coined many phrases. This, I call it the Stratfordian fallacy. What do I mean by the Stratfordian fallacy? What do you remember who came from Stratford? Willie Shakespeare, remember Willie? William Shakespeare came from Stratford, Stratford, England. And people have been writing books for 200 years saying, oh, he couldn't have written the plays. He was a country boy. He didn't have any university education. Uh, he couldn't have done all this stuff because he was just grew up in this little town in the middle of England. And uh, his father was uh, a uh, minor politician and speculated in the wool in, in the wool market, and uh, it couldn't have been. So therefore, somebody else must have written the plays. Well, you apply that logic to Daniel Drawball. Daniel Drawball was a poor country boy, and he had never been to university, and he had never been anywhere much, and he had no formal education that amounted to anything. Therefore, he could not have possibly understood what he was doing. Well, of course, it's not so. Uh, I think of Dava Sobel's book, Longitude. You read that one, maybe? Uh, <coughs> Parliament offered a 20,000 pound prize for anybody who could solve the problem of longitude, because, of course, you know, the problem was that Britain's naval ships were kept running into rocks and sinking because they didn't know where they were. And it was very embarrassing when you lost your ship and everybody drowned. So, uh, we have to fix this problem. Nobody can solve the problem of longitude because nobody can build a chronometer that really works. You have to know what time it is in London so you know where you are, and so forth. Uh, and it was John, again, a fellow named Harrison, who finally figured it out and did it. Well, they didn't believe him because he was just an uneducated country boy who was a carpenter, basically. And he was the one who did it, and nobody else, all the scientists at the time, could not do it. Therefore, they didn't believe he had done it. And he had a big argument to get the money. Well, same thing happens here in a different way. So Drobo was defeated by judges who did not understand that he could have done what he did. He didn't, they didn't believe it. Now, uh, so, of course, Daniel is devastated by this decision. 
The stock that he got in the company that he sold out to is worthless. The money he got, I'm sure, is spent, that he's gone. And he, but he keeps on going. He gets a lot of other patents in later years, which raises the question, why didn't he get a patent for the telephone, the really important thing that he had done? He said he was too poor, and he was a terrible witness. He said, oh, I never kept any records of my experiments, and I didn't really know what I was doing, and I didn't know what I had done when I did it, and, and he was just a disaster. Uh, but there he was. But he kept on going, and he got other patents, and the part I don't understand, he got patents for other devices to improve the telephone. Whether any of that ever amounted to anything, I have no idea. I have not been able to figure that out. Well, now there we are. Uh, did Daniel actually invent a telephone? Was it some kind of a, uh, a, uh, a fraud? Was it some kind of a you know, you tie the string to one end, you take the other uh, under the string to the other side of your playhouse, you can talk to each other on the string. Uh, some people thought it was that. Uh, I don't think so. I think he very likely he didn't have a telephone that worked. Now, what is fr so much more interesting about Dan now, in later years, he fools around with the idea of wireless transmission of, s of signals. Now, this was happening. Other people were trying to do it. The crazy sir, Nicholas Tesla, finally got a car name for him. He thought he could transmit not only signals, he thought he could transmit power. Actually, instead of having those great big ugly things going through your cornfield with the big arms transmitting the 500,000 volts, he thought he could do that without wires. Uh, Daniel thought he could do it too. And he thought he had gotten a signal to go four miles, and he had some witnesses that said he did. Well, we're not sure about that. Did he know what he was doing? Well, maybe he did, maybe he didn't. It wasn't until 1901. Actually, uh, Tesla had the interest, if you read Chernow's book on Morgan, not Chernow's Hamilton, you may have read, Chernow's Washington, Chernow has one on Morgan. And then he talks about how Morgan was interested in Tesla because he thought he could uh, uh, get this idea of wireless transmission to really be a moneymaker. And then he got the news that a, an Italian boy named Marconi had gotten a signal across the ocean in 1901. And he dropped Tesla like the proverbial hot potato. Goodbye, Mr. Tesla, I don't need you. I'm going to go and estimate Mr. Marconi and we'll have something we call RCA. So, we're not sure about that. We're just not sure. Now, what do I think about all this? I, uh, I think it, Daniel Drobo probably made a telephone that worked. I think these other people probably made telephones that worked too. I think Alexander Graham Bell had a telephone that worked. And maybe they all did. And so maybe everybody's right in a way. Now, what I have noticed is that this happens all the time. Uh, Morse himself, we give him credit. You learned this in school. Samuel Finley, Brees, Morse, four names, invented the telegraph. But a guy in England had already gotten one to work sort of it was already set up. They had a line in a, out of a coal mine with telegraph signals working before Morse got used to work. And there was a big fuss about that. Uh, you have other instances in technology. The airplane. Uh, we once went to Brazil as tourists, and there is a sign somewhere in, in Brazil, first in flight. They thought they invented somebody there had got an airplane to work before the Wright brothers. Uh, you go to Russia, they had somebody there that they thought was flying an airplane before the Wright brothers. Who knows? Uh, and of course, then there's the calculus. Now you want to terrorize an English major? Tell him he has to take calculus next semester. <laughs> well, I don't understand what calculus is, but I do know 
that a guy named Leibniz in Germany and a fellow named Isaac Newton in England both came up with the idea sort of at the same time. Leibniz published his stuff first. Isaac Newton said later, well, I was too busy. I didn't have time to publish mine. They got into a big uh, cat fight about who did it or who didn't do what first. And I guess we're not really sure. Uh, and the whole business about uh, fission, nu uh, nuclear fission. Who discovered that we could split the atom? Uh, I'll, do, I'll do this, and I'll see how many hands again. Who knows the name Lisa Meitner? Nobody does, but there she was. She did it, and she never got credit for it. She was Jewish, and she was a woman, and it was 1938. And Otto Hahn got the Nobel Prize, but Lisa Meitner didn't. So there you are. So that's what happened. So. Uh, what? Uh, okay. So the, the way I feel, I see this, when something's about to be discovered or invented, it happens, and somebody does it, and usually several people are doing it at the same time, and they all sort of have no don't quite know what they're doing and they fumble around and somebody gets to the patent office first, somebody gets to the, across the line, the finish line, whatever it is, first and gets the credit. But there's always a fuss about who really did it first. And the answer is sort of, that, well, they all did it, sort of, because that's the way it works. Uh, so. I am sympathetic to the Daniel Drawbow story, but I understand that it's more complicated than that. There's no simple answer. Yes, he did it first and all the other guys were second, third, and fourth. It's not that simple. It just isn't. Now, uh, now where else do we go with this story? You know, we really, there isn't much more to go on. Uh, you know, if you want to write about a life of Thomas Jefferson, he wrote three or four letters a day for 50 years or 60 years, and we've got all those letters. So scholars can dig and dig and dig and write and write and write. But if you want to write a book about Daniel Drawba, where you go? He didn't write any letters. He didn't keep any diaries. He didn't keep any lab notes. He didn't have any photographs. Uh, we only know, we, we know what was in the, the court, the, the record of the, the, the trials, the bat litigations. Uh, we know those, but basically we don't have on the spot records of what actually happened. We just don't know. And so I don't know that there's anywhere else to go with the story. Now, some of you out there are kinfolk, and you may know, you may have some stuff in your attic that would add to this. If you have, bring it out. But uh, I, I, I think it, the story's about over. Uh, when we leave here, you'll be invited upstairs to see Daniel Drawbow's artifacts, some of which are on display, some kind of a telephone, and uh, you know, he did some other things, he actually, built an electric clock that somehow worked from the ground. Somehow, I don't understand it. It was actually installed in St. Patrick's Cathedral in Harrisburg and in the office of a Dr. Moffat, a dentist. I don't know whether that's George's grandfather or what. I don't know that. Uh, in as late as the, around 19, the early 1900s, uh, Robert Myers, who was the grandfather of Senator Myers, the late Senator Myers of, of Cumberland County, asked Daniel to build a coin separating machine, and he did. And I think I think we have that here. Do we have that here? Somebody knows. All right. Anyway, uh, so most of the stuff he invented, it doesn't matter anymore. It uh, and it's a historical curiosity. It's what it is. Uh, I wonder out there now, 
got some kinfolk here. Can you add anything to this? Do you have anything? Do you have anything else that you know about? Perhaps not. Yes? The only thing that I can interject here was about 10 <coughs> years ago, there was an auction in Camp Hill oh, yeah. that uh, there was paperwork from Daniel Drobo, handwritten from Daniel Drobo. At the auction was representatives of the Cumberland County Historical Society. Well, then it, and it, it may be here and I may not know about it. And my understanding was it was going to be here. Uh, that's why I didn't bid against them and try and get them for right. family reasons. But uh, supposedly there was some handwritten notes or uh, I don't know whether they were on his experiments or, or what they were on, but uh, obviously he did write some stuff down. Well, that's interesting because I did not know about that, and I hope they bought it and it's here somewhere, but I'm not aware of that. I, well, we'll yeah. find that out today. Uh, maybe, uh, maybe, that, maybe some of that on display upstairs. But, uh, yes. So, uh, <laughs> yes, Daniel had a lot of children. Of course, as happened in those days, many, some of them died in childhood and infancy. Uh, I don't know how many survived to, to uh, leave descendants, but they were descendants. Uh, again, I'm a, I'm a great grandson of a sister. A, that, doesn't, that doesn't do too much for you. <laughs> so, all right, yes. Uh, the other books, as I say, the only book about drama is the harder book, which I guess is, uh, as I said, I went on Amazon and I found that there were two in the world and I bought one and I have it here. We uh, have other one. books? We have a book. We have one of the Oh, you have one? Yeah. Then you must have bought the other one. <laughs> <laughs> so there were, in Amazon there were two. When I, and I said about 10 years ago because I, I talked about this somewhere else. Uh, the Telephone Patent Conspiracy of 1876, the Elisha Gray Alexander Bell controversy. That's about uh, that's about the Elisha Gray story, which is another part of it. Actually, the Bell the Bell people had almost 600 separate lawsuits to defend and prosecute until they finally prevailed against all the other claimants. See, it was a big Donnybrook. Paul Beers, does anybody remember Paul Beers? Good friend of mine, wrote for the Harrisburg Patriot News, a weekly column about local history for many years. Uh, talked about this, and he doesn't take Daniel very seriously. He did an essay called The Tinkerer of Everly's Mills. And Dan Grobo on the telephone published in the published in a collection of, of Paul Beer's uh, stuff uh, called Profiles of the Susquehanna Valley. It was published uh, and it's autographed here by, by Paul Beer's by copy in 1974. So uh, Paul Beer's had a column. He upset me every year because he would, in those days, he would do a weekly column for the paper, paper and he would talk about people's birthdays and give their ages. He used to give mine. Yeah, it was terrible. But, okay. But, uh, uh, interesting. Well, Beer says, Drawball himself never denied Bell's invention of the telephone. He maintained only that Bell did it separately and later than he. Well, that may be. Uh, but again, we're puzzled. Uh, why was he such a terrible witness? Why didn't he get to the patent office? He got a lot of other stuff to the patent office. So it cost 10 bucks. Well, 10 bucks is serious money, but he did it a number of times. He got a lot of patents, but none of them really mattered. The one that mattered, he didn't get. Why didn't he do that? I think we will not know. Uh, so uh, that's about all there is to the story. There's, 
not much else you can add to it at this point. I think it's pretty much a closed story. Unless somebody finds something out somewhere, somewhere that we don't know about now. These stories go on. Uh, uh, the Watson Crick story about DNA. There was another woman named Frankenthaler who apparently made major discoveries in discovering the nature of the DNA molecule that she never got credit for. Again, she was a woman. We tended not to take women seriously, even 50 years ago when we were first finding out about DNA. Uh, and, uh, and of course, I, uh, you must not forget Judy Garland. Why must you not forget Judy Garland? Because a couple of guys named Martin and Blaine got the contract to write some songs for her a movie called Meet Me in St. Louis, produced in 1944. And in that movie is a song called Have Yourself a Merry Little Christmas. It's become a one of the great Christmas songs that you hear endlessly every Christmas. And two guys named Martin and Blaine wrote it, but then later on they got into a famous argument about who did it. Martin said, no, I did it. Blaine didn't do it at all because I just gave him credit because I was a nice guy and I, I was naive. And that argument was bitterly contested and became a cause celebrity in the songwriting world. And they never reconciled. They never spoke again, these two guys. Isn't that awful? So, so good things that are done in the world are often embroiled in controversy. Why do we do that? But we do. So, it's a great song. I, I think that's about all I can say about this unless you have some questions.